Hello everybody. And we continue to study geometry of curves. And now an assertion which I would like to call lemma. I think it, this is the first lemma in this section. I hope I'm not mistaken with numbering because I couldn't find recording of former lecture just before it. <coughs> so, <coughs> lemma one is, I would say, obvious from geometrical point of view. What it says about. So, if you have a curve and it is rectifiable, so you know there is a length of this curve, then if you split that curve into two parts, then the length of the total curve is equal to the length, to the sum of lengths of those two parts. So, seems to be absolutely obvious, right? But remember that the definition now is rather complicated. What is length? Length is supremum of length of those polygonal curves, right? So, why it should be with this property? So, lemma 1 is precise formulation of this <coughs> property. So, <coughs> um, Okay, how to call it? Let's be R of T. R of T has bounded variation on A B if and only if. For each t in the interval a b, r has bounded variations, bounded variations on a c and c b. Moreover. In each of those cases, cases, total variation of R over AB is equal to the sum of total variations. That is what was illustrated by this picture. <coughs> now proof. Recall what is total variation of R over interval AB. By definition, this is the supremum over all partitions of the interval AB of such sums. <coughs> Where supremum is taken over all partitions of the interval A B. So that is R of A, that is R of B, the origin, origin, <coughs> and 
what we are doing um, if we consider the interval of time let's say right so that is the interval of time and if we take positions here right then related positions are over there okay let it be r of q1 and so on <clears throat> there is a question can you focus and zoom the image please <laughs> it's for you <laughs> Okay, let me denote it with sum as total variation for not total variation, partial variation for oh great partial variation for the um, partition p so what it means geometrically what is it that is the length of this polygonal curve so okay with others right so v of p r is precisely the length of inscribed polygonal curve okay now, uh, let us consider two partitions. Q1 is, okay, I don't know where is it, uh, where is C. So suppose C belongs to the interval TK, TK, not TK, T, let's say L, L plus one, right? So somewhere in between, like here, you see, the point of splitting is over there. That is R of C. And C is somewhere between two points. Of course, it may coincide. In this case, the situation is even easier. So in any case, what do we do? P1 is a partition of AC, partition of AC. P2 is partition of CB. So we make extra point C as a point of both partitions and one partition is so what it means it means that now we'll consider so you see instead of here we have one interval right and now we consider two sides of this triangle right so we replace one side of our polygonal curve by two sides that is geometrically so let me draw this picture separately in more detail so that is r of t l r of t l plus one and that is r of c so what we are doing, we introduce C as a point of our partition. So it means we replace one side of our polygonal curve by two sides of this triangle. Okay, now let me write 
let me use the definition. So what we have now, look, what is supremum? Here supremum is written. What it means? It means that for arbitrary epsilon greater than zero, there exists a partition P such that total variation of R A B minus epsilon less than the length of our polygonal curve less or equal than this supremum. That is by the definition of supremum. What means supremum? It means when you make this supremum slightly smaller, immediately it will be not an upper bound, right? For the set. So it means there is a polygonal curve which has length greater than this, not an upper bound. Okay, <clears throat> then what we do? Now, look at this sum, V of PR. So what is V of PR? This sum, so the length of this polygonal curve, original polygonal curve. And what we can do with it? We observe that we can write it like that, less or equal than sum k from 1 up to L, R of t, no, uh, L plus 1. Let me write prime here. What I mean by prime, I'll explain. t k minus R of t k minus 1 plus sum for k from l plus 1 up to m also prime r of t k minus r of t k minus 1 where prime means that so here look t l plus 1 is c there is meaning of this prime. Tl plus 1 is C. Instead of Tl plus 1, we take C. Yeah? Ah, there is a question. Professor, can you explain again why are we using the definition of supremum instead of the length? <laughs> the length is the supremum. <laughs> of the length of polygonal curves. <laughs> no other definition of the length. The only one definition. So the length is the supremum of the length of polygonal curves, nothing else. Okay, so TL plus 1 equals to C, right? Now, for this sum. And what means prime here? TL instead of TL, here TL equals to C once again, right? So what we do, we replace, when we consider, for example, when we consider this part, instead of TL plus 1, we take C. When we consider the second part, instead of TL, we consider C. That's it. Okay, now, what is written here is precisely V of P1. R and V of P2 R. And of course, P1 is a partition of AC and it is less or equal than less or equal than the sum of no sorry. V of P1 is less or equal than supremum, and that is total variation. V of R over AC. For the first. And for the second, analogously, V of R over C B. <coughs> okay. 
then of course uh, what we observe also uh, that look if we have arbitrary partitions p1 and p2 if we have arbitrary so for arbitrary partitions p1 of a c and for arbitrary partition p2 of cb we have the sum is precisely equal to this that is obviously geometrically but also it's clear analytically so geometrically what it means the sum of two polygonal curves so from here up to this point and from that point up to the terminal point the sum of those two polygonal curves is equal to the sum total sum of the polygonal curve from a to b right that is obvious but now look since this quantity is less or equal than total variation of our function over the whole interval a b then what happens look so this sum of quantities less or equal than this number right okay and it's true for arbitrary p1 and p2 then for sure the sum of supremums also less or equal than this number so once again we have this sum is less or equal than that one right for arbitrary p1 and p2 that is supremum of all such this supremum of all such terms sum of them is always less or equal than this one then sum of supremums is also less or equal than that right so now remember that v of p r is greater or equal look that one i should put here right and now what happens look so let me indicate what I underlined, right? That is not less so equal, that is this inequality, right? Yeah. Look what we have now. Oops, something wrong. Somebody asked me something. Could you cancel this? Please cancel this. Click OK. <coughs> Why T of L plus 1 is C and T of L is also equal to C? That is, that is just for this sum prime. That is an agreement, right? So for this sum, that is only for that one. And here also only for that sum. So here I put prime. What means prime? Prime means that this is not as usually. I mean, usually we just replace k by 1 and so on by L plus 1, right? Now, this is not as usually. Why? What is unusual? Unusual is that when k equals to l plus 1, then instead of t l plus 1, we should take c. Just for this sum, and that is meaning of this prime. Clear? And same for that one. <clears throat> now, look. What is underlined? 
So for arbitrary epsilon greater than zero, we have that the sum of those two quantities is between this number and same number minus epsilon, where epsilon is arbitrarily small. When it may happen, if and only if, we have equality, right? Because of epsilon is arbitrary. So we have equality. And now let me also to mention that, in fact, uh, Firstly, I started with finite quantity here, right? So I started with finite quantity here. OK, then it works. Now let's go from finite quantity here. Let this be finite. Then what happens? Those quantities are bounded, right? And you see that. For arbitrary partition P, I can write this estimate, and it means that those quantities are bounded by this sum for any partition P. So look once again. So firstly, I started with this supposition. So I supposed that R is bounded variation in AB on the whole interval, right? On the whole interval AB. And then we proved that it is of bounded variation on each of paths, right? On that one and here. Now go back in opposite direction. So we suppose now here it has finite length and over there it has finite length or bounded variation was the same, right? Then, how we proceed? So now we know for arbitrary P1 and P2, this is true, right? This is true. This is true. This estimate. Then what we do? So for arbitrary partition P, we can proceed like that, right? And it means that for arbitrary partition P, those sums of lengths of polygonal curves are bounded by this number. Then the function has bounded variation over whole AB. And uh, converse direction is also completed. OK? Then the lemma is proved completely. So you see that although geometrically it's absolutely obvious, right? But you need to be careful because uh, intuition, in fact, about curves, you see, continuous curve, you may think, oh, it's very good curve, continuous curve. But in fact, there is so-called piano curve, which goes through every point of the square. Square, not a contour of square. There is a curve which goes through every point of square. Every point. Curve. Continuous curve. Of course, it has self intersections. It is not smooth, but there is a curve. So, continuous curve which go goes through every point of square. A very strange situation may happen. That is why you need to be very careful when you refer to your intuition. Oh, length is obvious. But what is length? What is the length of this curve? Of course, it makes no sense, right? To talk about length of the square. <laughs> and in fact, it is infinity. Of course. <clears throat> okay. So. Let's continue. Uh, ne next lemma. Next lemma. Lemma two. <coughs> there is sufficient condition. Of 
or finite length. If a curve R of T a less or equal to t less or equal to b is differentiable and r prime of t is bounded on a b then r has bounded variation on a b so if there is bounded derivative then the function has bounded variation or in terms in terms of curve if the curve is differentiable and derivative is bounded then the length is finite. Proof. <coughs> Sorry. So, <coughs> proof. Um, okay. <coughs> Let me consider length of a polygonal curve which is inscribed into our curve, right? Length of a polygonal curve. What is it? That is the sum r of tk minus r of tk minus 1. Then we apply the theorem tail, uh, sorry, Lagrange mean value theorem for vector functions, for vector functions from former lecture, right? We know we cannot write equality here, but we can estimate. Each term can be estimated by what? by a value of, not a value, but by the length of uh, the derivative at an arbitrary, or not arbitrary, sorry, of a certain, there exists a point xi k, right? There exists a point xi k somewhere between tk and tk minus 1 side that we can write the following estimate oh i forget about some sorry sum k from one up to m of course we apply lagrange mean value theorem to each of terms and then we write tk minus tk minus one that is because of differentiability differentiability now we use second supposition. R prime is bounded. So let me estimate then those derivatives by the supremum of R prime. Okay, let it be of psi, psi in AB. Times the sum of tk minus tk minus 1. But this sum, of course, is nothing else but b minus a. So we have an estimate. An estimate. And you see, the estimate does not depend on p. So as a consequence, we did use, hence, the total variation or in other words, uh, the length of our curve R is bounded by supremum 
r prime i will write like that times b minus a i'll also use this estimation later so let me put star here inequality star will be used later but for a while let me yeah uh, so a lemma is proved right but also <clears throat> let me mention a corollary corollary if r is continuously differentiable differentiable on a b then r has bounded variation on a b why because if derivative is continuous then this length also is continuous function and as we know arbitrary continuous function on a closed interval is bound then everything is okay so suppositions of our lemma are satisfied let me give an example of uh, a bad situation when a function hasn't bounded variation or in other terms when the length is infinite so example example consider function f of x equals to x cosine let's say pi over x if x is not zero is zero if x is zero that is continuous function it is differentiable everywhere except for zero and let us prove that this function has unbounded variation or if you want the graph of this function has infinite length in other words so the graph of this function has infinite length it is a little bit unexpected but if you because look how it looks like you have y equals to x right and you have cosine graph which multiplied like that right and it has infinite length why because too many oscillations although amplitude small and smaller but nevertheless uh, altogether it's too much so the length is infinite how to prove it okay so uh, we should solve the equation cosine pi over x is equal to plus or minus one right so <clears throat> you see when it is one okay i'll start with one just one then pi over x equals to two pi k k into uh, not uh, into let me consider only positive numbers so x k equals to pi over uh, sorry cancel pi right so 1 over 2k 1 over 2k and yeah and also cosine pi over x equals to minus 1 gives pi over x equals to pi plus 2 pi k analogously x is 1 over 2k plus 1 so you see that uh, point 
of the form 1 over natural number are precisely the points which are interested, interesting for us. So now let me denote partition like that. So T0 is 0 and T M plus 1 minus J equals to 1 over J for J from 1 up to M. So the smallest should be with highest, right? If j equals to 1, then we have tm, the last, the very last, right? So that is a partition of 0, 1. tm equals to 1, right? That is a partition of 0, 1. Okay? That is a partition. P. So what is the length of a polygonal line, which is <laughs> so R here is precisely the graph. So R is x f of x, the graph of our function. The graph of our function is our curve, right? So, what is it? Uh, in general, it's like that. R of tk minus R of tk minus 1. And you see, for k equals to 1, here we have t0, R of 0 is 0, right? So, and T1, what is T1? T1 corresponds to J equals to M, right? So 1 over M. So it means I have term, um, so R of T1 is 1 over M and Okay, it doesn't matter. It's uh, either 1 or minus 1. I don't know what is cosine. So, mm, plus minus 1 doesn't matter. That is cosine, right? Times x and x is 1 over m. That is r of t1. Plus or minus depends on uh, even or odd, right? On evenness of. Uh, M. And it doesn't matter because T0 is 0, R of T0 is 0. So it means the first term is 1 over M. Yeah, just 1 over M, right? The first term. Plus, then sum for K from 2 up to m, and what they are. So, it means I should consider like that. That is our, our polygonal curve, right? Inscribed in the graph. So, mm, length of one piece is square root of uh, the step is 1 over m, right? The difference between squared plus this is precisely, yeah, also same, right? Because cosine is either plus or minus 1. Yeah. And same is here, so 1 over m squared. Now, that is. And. No, 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 what I wrote. Oh, it's wrong. wrong. Sorry. Okay, let's have a break after that. I write correctly. It's wrong. Let me go to j's instead of k. 
So G from um, 1 up to m minus 1 then because j equals to m is considered separately and then what happens for those points look uh, for r of tj not tj it's m plus 1 minus j t m plus 1 minus j right is what is it 1 over j is x coordinate right 1 over j is x coordinate and what is y coordinates 1 over j times plus or minus 1 so plus or minus 1 over j but for neighboring points what happens for neighboring points 1 over j and for neighboring point 1 over let's say j plus 1 which sign we should choose for two neighboring points look for even we have plus for odd we have minus right so opposite sign for neighboring for neighbors right opposite sign for neighbors so if here plus then over there is minus and vice versa right okay then what is so these are neighbor points right what is distance between those points let me insert it here so square root of what difference of those two right and then difference of those two but difference of those two gives us the sum without signs right if we look at it so that is let me write the answer then so what is it It gives 1 over j minus 1 over j plus 1 squared for x and 1 over j plus 1 over j plus 1 for y. That's it, right? That is the length. Then I write greater or equal, greater or equal, 1 over m, and I'll forget about that one forget about it what remains sum j from 1 up to m minus 1 and here also <coughs> yeah no square right so 1 over j plus 1 over j plus 1 right that's it And that is the, what is it? Greater or equal than sum j from 1 up to m, 1 over j. And even twice, I think. No, not twice, because 1 over 1 only once. Doesn't matter. So you see, 1 over 1 is here only once. Other are twice but I have greater or equal so I forget about two equal terms uh, it, it will be smaller right if I forget about two but we know that this series just right this tends to infinity as m tends to infinity right and what it means the length of this inscribed polygonal line tends to infinity. It's a little bit surprising, but that is the case. So, the function has unbounded variation and the curve 
is not rectifiable. That is an example, non-trivial example of non-rectifiable curve. Okay, now we are ready to prove theorem which allows to compute the <coughs> so I don't remember number. It seems three, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this is three or in this section. First theorem was Lagrange. No second. Ah, I see. No second. Then it is second. Okay. Second. <coughs> Okay. Okay. Theorem two. Yeah, let it be for the case of continuously differentiable curve. If R of T is continuously differentiable differentiable then the length s of t equals to Total variation of our function r on zero, not differentiable on a t, differentiable on a b. I forget to indicate the interval a b. The length is differentiable. Differentiable. And, and s prime of t equals to r prime of t. Differentiable. Okay, let it be on a, b, like that. Let's include it because for the differentiability on the closed interval, we had an agreement like for continuity left and right and derivative from related side. Okay, proof. So consider. T not in the interval a b let's say okay let it be a b like that and delta t positive so if we come want to compute s prime at t not then by definition we should compute the following limit delta t tends to plus zero or zero plus doesn't matter s of t naught plus delta t minus s of t naught over delta t that is by definition of derivative right now let's look at this difference s of t naught plus delta t minus s of t naught that is difference of Variations of r over interval a t naught plus delta t and variation on the interval from a up to t naught. 
by lemma one lemma one says that is variation of r over t naught t naught plus delta t so the length uh, yeah difference of those variations is precisely oh sorry a without vector of course <laughs> then look now i'll apply lemma 2 lemma 2 and we can estimate by using inequality star inequality star so i will write maximum of r prime of t for t in the interval from t naught up to t naught plus delta t times the length of this interval that is delta t okay then of course that is non-negative right because yeah this is non-negative this is non-negative Then divide by delta t, and what we obtain? What we obtain? Zero less or equal s of t naught plus delta t minus s of t naught over delta t. Uh, not zero even i would say i need better estimate sorry i need to yeah question thank you question shouldn't be max r prime times delta t r prime of course thanks thanks of course r prime r prime of course thanks thanks a lot for this remark yeah, but for the left hand side, let me return to the proof. So I wrote here an estimate. So look what happens. We consider such a piece of curve R of T naught here. R of t naught plus delta t over there right and now as we know this difference s of t naught plus delta t minus s of t naught that is precisely the length of this piece of our curve this piece right now i wrote here an estimate below which estimate below? Look, what happens? Uh, okay. <coughs> Look, what I wrote here is what is it? That is precisely the length of this vector, right? The length of this vector from the initial point of that piece to the terminal point of course the length of our curve for sure is greater or equal than the length of this straight line right the straight is uh, shortest way right so that is the inequality below okay then what i am doing I divide the inequality which was obtained before. I divide by delta t. What it gives? Yeah, I divide by delta t that one. Delta t is positive, so it will be inside. Then I divide this part. And then I divide the right hand side by delta t. 
That is what we obtain, right? Now look, if delta t tends to zero, what happens? We know r prime is continuous, right? Then r prime of t, t is here, tends to what? r prime at t naught, right? So this tends to length of r prime at t naught as delta t tends to zero. Then what is about that one? The same, right? That is precisely r prime at t naught when delta t tends to zero. So both tend to the same as delta t tends to plus zero, right? Hence, the middle also tends to the same quantity, and that is precisely S prime, which is the length of R prime. Okay, theorem is proved, and as a corollary, now we can <coughs> prove the rule to compute lengths of curves with integral, which was used in <coughs> which I mentioned as application of definite integral during last semester, but without proof. Now we have proved it. So, <coughs> as a corollary, corollary, if <coughs> r prime r sorry is continuously differentiable differentiable on a b <coughs> then the length of the curve r of t is given by s of b equals to integral from a to b r prime of t d Proof. Okay, look what we had. Mm. So we know S prime is that one, right? We know derivative of the length, right? If we know derivative, then how to compute? We apply Newton Leibniz formula. Newton Leibniz formula. formula, which says that s of b minus s of a equals to integral from a to b s prime of t dt, right? Because s prime is continuous. If r prime is continuous, then s prime is continuous as well, right? Then look, s of a is obviously zero, because what is s of a? length in one point that is zero and s prime is that one that's all right it gives the proof and also particular cases particular cases so first graph of y equals to f of x, x in a, b. Here, what we have, like in example, r of x, parameter is x, is x, f of x. 
it is differentiable if f of x is differentiable and continuously differentiable if f is continuously differentiable. Then what is the length according to our formula? The length of the graph is given by integral from a to b r prime of t dt and what is it uh, sorry r prime of x dx and what is it what is it what is it look length of derivative look at derivative what is r prime of x we differentiate 1 f prime of x that is the vector right so what is the length of this vector square root of components what it gives integral from a to b square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx that is the formula which we had right also Second curve in R three R of T is given by X of T, Y of T, Z of T, Z of T, where T is let's say from A to B. Then what is length? Length. Once again, if all those functions are continuous differentiable, then we can compute the length that is integral from a to b. Derivative just put primes everywhere, it's clear, right? And we obtain square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared plus z prime of t squared dt. That is also the formula for derivative of a parametrically given curve. Parametrically given curve. Oof. Have five minutes. <coughs> okay, couple of lemmas then. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> uh, definition. The parameter S of T is called the arc length parameter parameter or natural parameter <coughs> for a smooth curve R of T. So, why we can consider it as a parameter? Because, look, uh, for a smooth curve, <coughs> what happens with the S prime? So suppose t is a function of another parameter to. So you make a change of parameter for the same curve, for the same curve, right? Then s prime of t, uh, uh, not s prime, the total length, length of the curve is given by integral from a to b r prime of t 
dt, right? And if we make a substitution, t equals to t of tau, then what happens with this integral? Integral from a to b, r prime of t of tau, not alpha beta, let's say, right? So t of tau, tau varies from alpha to beta. You change parameter, you change parameter, right? make a replacement of parameter, then it gives according to substitution in integrals. t prime of tau d tau, right? And suppose t prime strictly positive, and it was okay for a smooth curve, right? Such a change of parameter. Then, look, what is it? Ah, prime. I forget prime. T prime may, may be inserted into the length, right? That is number. And then what is written is precisely the derivative of R, let's say, rho of rho prime of tau d tau where rho of tau is our curve written in terms of new parameter, right? So what it says? It says that the formula for the length is correct from the point of view of change of parameter, right? So remember that we accepted only changes of parameter for smooth curves such that derivative should be never zero, right? If it is always negative, it's almost the same, but here we should put minus because of uh, this uh, wrong order of variables, right? So, in fact, you see that the length is invariant with respect to change of parameter. Right? And also parameter S of T, of course, can be considered. Why? Because if the curve is smooth, then, as we know by definition, derivative is never zero, right? So S prime is never zero. That, that is okay, right? So indeed, we can consider a parameter. And that is natural parameter from many points of view. Maybe I'll give, I want to give two lemmas, but <coughs> yeah, lemma, lemma three, right? Lemma three. R of t is given with arc length parameter t if and only if only if r prime of t equals to 1 for all t. That is a criteria which shows when you have arc length parameter or natural parameter. Proof? Proof? Proof is almost immediate. So look, as we know, s prime of t equals to model r prime of t, right? And if it is 1, then what follows? s prime of t is 1, s of 0 is 0, hence s of t equals to what? Solve this differential equation. Very easy differential equation. s prime of t is always 1, s of 0 is 0. s of t equals to t, right? Yeah. So, indeed, t is arc length. And vice versa, of course, right? So, <clears throat> if t is 
arc length, then of course it should be one, right? Because uh, that is by definition. So s of t is just t. Okay, and one minute. Let me give lemma four. Lemma four. If let's say a of f of t f of t is a vector function of a constant length up, then f prime of t is orthogonal to f of t for all t. Orthogonal means, okay, proof. And then I'll say what is orthogonal. Orthogonal means f prime of t times f of t equals to zero. <coughs> so that is what we want to prove. Then, what is constant length? So, modular f of t is constant, right? Constant length. Let me put here square, squared. And what is square of length? That is scalar product of the vector onto itself. Now we have equality, identically, constant, differentiated. We know how to differentiate scalar products. Differentiate first times second plus second times first. But they are equal to each other, right? So if we differentiate, we obtain 2 times f prime f of t. And that is precisely what we want. Right? That's all. So, lemmas at least. I proved lemmas, but not theorem. Let me remember number of theorem. Two, so, okay. Okay, that's all for today.